I hope you are here for the Spotted Lanternfly talk that we are hosting during Washington In Invasive Species Awareness Week. I am here on behalf of the Washington Invasive Species Council, and I'm their Education and Outreach Coordinator. So just to kind of set the tone for what the talk is going to look like today, I'm going to go through a few slides very briefly just in the beginning to kind of take care of some housekeeping items and some frequently asked questions right off the bat. And then I'm going to hand it over to Josh and he's going to be giving you the actual talk today. So again, hopefully you're here for the spotted lanternfly talk. That is today's topic. We had feral swine yesterday and we're going to be talking about aquatic invasive species tomorrow. So just like a quick background in case you haven't been around before you weren't aware. Um, this week from February 22nd until February 28th is Washington Invasive Species Awareness Week. We are hosting this in conjunction with the National Invasive Species Awareness Week, which is kind of cool. We get to host them simultaneously. Um, and Governor Inslee proclaimed this week, so it's very official. You can see the proclamation on the slide. And so we're really excited to be hosting it. Obviously, this year it had to go virtual. And so we have a whole host of webinars that we're gonna be doing and putting on this whole week. We have some exciting online events as well as a lot of social media things that you can share with some information about uh, pathways, prevention, simple action steps you can take, things like that. Because really when it comes down to it, it's on all of us to prevent invasive species, either completely from coming into a new area or at least to slow their spread. So just some quick housekeeping items. Um, number one, this is a webinar. So it's a little bit different than if you're uh, more familiar with the Zoom meetings where you're not gonna have access to your camera or your microphone. That's totally normal. That's how the software is supposed to work. Uh, this webinar is being recorded as of right now and we are gonna be posting it to the council's YouTube page later in the week. And once that happens and we have the entire week's worth of webinars, we'll make sure to send out an email uh, and some social media blasts, just kind of sharing those and where you can find them. If you're having any issues at all, whether you can't hear us or see us, please just leave a note in the chat. I'm gonna be monitoring those while Josh is presenting and I'll try to help you as quickly as I can. If for whatever reason the webinar fails because that's just where we are in the middle of winter here in Washington, um, we'll just give it a few seconds and then we'll all try to log back in and we'll just pick up where we left off. And then lastly, there will be time for questions at the end. We're hoping for about 10 to 15 minutes to answer some of those questions. So as Josh is presenting his material, if anything comes to mind or you wanna know a little bit more detail about something, feel free to either use the question and answer box, which is in the bottom of your menu, or you can type it in the chat. Like I said, I'll be monitoring that as we go throughout the presentation. But we really want this to be something that's valuable and that you get your questions answered and has a lot of great material in it. So please don't hesitate to ask. And then lastly, for those of you who are seeking pesticide recertification credits, um, this webinar is worth one pesticide recertification credit. And the way that we're going to award you those credits is at the end of the presentation, there's gonna be a code word that I'm gonna display on the screen. It's gonna be very obvious. So if you're just now getting logged in, don't worry, you haven't missed anything yet. Um, the speaker, or I will, I'll announce what the code word is. I'll have it um, up on the screen. We'll leave it up there for a few minutes and then we'll give additional instructions again at that time, just in case you forgot. So I'll want you to type that code word into the chat to prove your attendance. And then once this meeting is over, I'm planning on sending an email to all the participants with further instructions and then just kind of follow those instructions down the line. It's really simple. I just need some information from you um, and you can reply to me, but that will come directly to the email that you use to register for this webinar. And there's even some additional instructions if you're watching this as part of a group um, that you can kind of look and see to make sure that you're doing all the things that you need to do. So with that, I am happy to announce that we have Josh here with us on behalf of the Washington State Department of Agriculture, and he is going to tell you everything you ever wanted to know about Spotted Lanternfly. So take it away, Josh. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, just making sure uh, everyone can see my slides. Yeah, looks great. Great. All right. So uh, I thought I'd go with a little bit of a background of who I am, what I do for uh, employment, and uh, kind of uh, we'll go over quickly, very quickly. Uh, this is a couple of years worth of work research that's been conducted on the East Coast. 
on this little character called the uh, spotted lanternfly. I'm going to move this up here. I'm not sure if that everyone can see my, my camera, but I just want to make sure. There we go. So again, my name is Joshua Milnes. I work for Washington State Department of Agriculture in the Plant Protection Department studying the biology and ecology of apple maggots here in Washington State. And I'm looking at other integrated pest management um, projects that I'm involved with, uh, specifically looking at uh, biological control of apple maggot, roast and girdle, and brown marmorated stink bug, which are uh, um, pests of econ economic concern here in the uh, uh, state. So let's see here. Um, oops, perfect. Gotta make sure I, how's that work? Okay, there we go. Uh, so, I, I thought we'd go back with uh, a little bit of a background um, is needed in, in, in respect to this uh, new pest that we're going to be talking about. So my boss, Sven Eric, um, at the time was employed by the uh, Pennsylvania State Department of Agriculture. And prior to the onslaught of this invasive pest, uh, there was no uh, protocol that was set in response to deal with um, this issue, if it was ever to get into the uh, state. And so Sven, with his colleagues at the time, developed the Spotted Lanternfly Response Manual in case of emergency. Good thing they did that actually. Um, they, they, had planned, uh, they had a plan of action ready because just in a few months later, the first detections of this plant hopper was discovered in the state of Pennsylvania. On September uh, 20, uh, 22nd, 2014, first reports of the spotted lanternfly were detected in a private property in eastern um, Berks County, Pennsylvania, where the report of uh, feeding damage on a uh, tree of heaven was um, there. Having a plan ready prepared or, uh, uh, allowed everyone in the state to respond correctly to the invasive species. So this is important, uh, developing an integrated pest management program and preparing oneself prior to the onslaught of invasive species. So, what is the spotted lanternfly anyways? Uh, um, basically, spotted lanternfly, Lacoma dalicatula, is a plant hopper in the family of Fregoridae. There is about 129 genera with about 696 species in the world. Only nine genera and 17 species are present in North America. Worldwide, Lacoma is represented by seven species. Like most plant hoppers, they use their proboscis uh, which has, is about the size of a uh, quarter of an inch. Uh, think, think of it more like a straw or a, um, um, it, it, yeah, think, you know, that's, that's actually a good way of looking. I think it's like basically a, a straw for a mouth part um, where they actually suck up the uh, solutions of that plant. Uh, this is what they call a piercing sucking effect uh, where they feed on the carbohydrates found in the phloem sap of trees uh, which is nutrient-rich compounds with many other plant products and usually lacking toxins, which is great for the bug, not so much for us uh, and not so much for homeowners and growers. So these are actually a very, uh, they're not only a nuisance pest, but a pest of economic concern. In this slide here, you can see the, uh, the beak is what they call it, or the proboscis, that's the Latin term for it. It's about seven millimeters in length again, about a quarter of an inch. The diameter or the length of this pest, it's about two inches long. I mean, think of it the size of your thumb. So uh, fairly large uh, you know, insect that we're uh, having to deal with here, or I should say the uh, researchers on the East Coast have to deal with. Uh, the spotted lanternfly uh, is native to Asia. It's found all over China, Bangladesh, and Vietnam. It was introduced to Japan, South Korea, and recently in 2014 in the state of Pennsylvania. This image here is a really cool image of a geographical map highlighting just how far away from its natural habitat the spotted lanternfly is capable of spreading. In South Korea, it quickly got out of hand and spread all over the country in a matter of just three short years. They consider it an invasive species over there, which has been reported to be negatively impacting grapes and peaches. In Pennsylvania, the story has been significantly different thanks to those who are working hard to control this invasive pest. Uh, however, as of December of 2020, 26 counties in Pennsylvania are now under quarantine 
for spotted lanternfly. Spotted lanternfly has been detected in 11 uh, eastern states, sadly to say. Uh, we're looking at Connecticut, Delaware, Massachusetts, Maryland, North Carolina, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Virginia, West Virginia, and as of recently, sadly to say, uh, the state of uh, Ohio. To show the spread of the spot, spotted lanternfly in Philadelphia, this map shows a handful of uh, counties with the Burke County kind of in the center. You can see that, that purple highlighted uh, region. Now, in this particular uh, survey, they start um, surveying all over. Green indicates not, uh, or spot, green indicates spot lanternflies um, areas that have yet to be detected. Of course, this was a while back and they're soon uh, starting to spread dramatically. Um, um, then it just starts to uh, radiate. As you can see here in the blue, uh, throughout the state as the years went by, it has become more orange colored as they spread from the blue counties. Spreading very quickly, and as I said in the last slide, last year was the first detection of spotted lanternfly in Ohio. One of the reasons why this insect spreads so fast is because the tree of heaven. And more likely, we can safely bet that the state of Ohio will see more counties established uh, with spotted lanternfly due to the tree of, of heaven. We'll talk more about the tree of heaven um, later in this presentation, um, but it's important to know uh, that's how it's going to be spreading very quickly in addition to other vectors. But what are these other vectors? Well, if you can see in this map, uh, they've, uh, researchers and um, concerned um, you know, citizens, um, citizen scientists have been uh, surveying for uh, spotted lanternfly in other uh, counties surrounding um, Burke County. And then what they did is they were doing what's called a band survey. We'll talk about what a band survey is a little later, but they're uh, mapping out to see whether or not there are um, outliers or uh, uh, possible new introductions of spotted lanternfly within their state here in Pennsylvania. State of Pennsylvania started finding patterns. You can see here uh, at one of their sites, um, this particular area is classic when we talk about introduction of invasive species. Uh, the green spots indicate trap sites where spotted lanternfly has yet to be detected. Uh, red spots indicate trap sites where they have been de detected, but notice where you're finding them. Industrial areas, um, downtown uh, areas where there's high um, traffic, um, both uh, in the uh, industrial, railroads, uh, highways, uh, wherever there's any human interaction, more likely you're going to start seeing the spread. And then it has a fan effect where you, you see them in the urban areas, and then they start to creep into the agricultural areas, which is exactly what we're seeing in Philadelphia right now. Here's another example. As you can see here, there's the railroads, uh, the uh, uh, area is heavily populated with um, industrial uh, factories. Uh, these are excellent places where tra um, trains can come in, uh, bring in their supplies, and also hitchhikers. So those hitchhikers are the spotted lanternflies. Uh, they, they can move very rapidly uh, with our help, sadly to say. So this is actually an example of how an invasive species can kind of um, become a global problem. It's not just here. Another example is the brown marmorated stink bug, which has spread all over the world. Um, by these examples. So this is, this is a, uh, a serious issue. Truck drivers and uh, a lot of the industry over there are now getting trained to look under their, their uh, vehicles, like the rims, uh, you know, even homeowners. If you're going out camping, they have to start doing that now over in uh, uh, Philadelphia. So the thing is, that's something we need to uh, start considering over here, if it would ever get into our industry. It's not in our industry. And I'm gonna constantly say that through this uh, uh, presentation because I do wanna remind people not to panic yet, but we need to take this seriously. Again, another example, and you can see the pattern here. You, we're starting to radiate away from the uh, site of introduc uh, introduction. Again, we're finding more and more industrial regions where they're, uh, they're promoting the spread, or uh, indirectly the, the promoting the spread of these uh, invasive species. 
What does that mean for uh, Washington State? Well, Washington State is the second largest producer of premium wines in the nation. With bottles sold in all 50 states and exported worldwide, according to the Washington State Wine Commission, we are home to over a thousand wineries with more than 400 grape growers and over 60,000 acres of vineyards uh, with a total economic impact of $8.4 billion value added. So this is a really big industry here in Washington State. So you can see why we are taking Spotted Lanternfly very seriously in Washington State. WSDA has been monitoring for Spotted Lanternfly for several years now. We have been taking observation samples at various locations in vineyards, Tree of Heaven, and other hosts throughout the state. We are doing this in response to the pressure that Spotted Lanternfly has had on the grape industry over in the East Coast. We don't want that to repeat the same story here. Uh, if it does get into our industry, it would be a disaster. So that's something we need to be more aggressive on. And that's why WSDA is um, taking up the mantle on this. The good news is, so far we have come up with only negative sightings, but that does not mean they are here. It just means that we have yet to detect them. So again, Washington, State's Depart um, Washington State Department of Agriculture its goal is to respond and to be ready uh, before the crisis hits our industry. And that's what it comes down to, folks. Integrated pest management done right is prepared prior to the invasion of an invasive species. So you can see here on the map, uh, all those yellow um, dots, those indicate visual surveys. Um, last year, we focused more on the east side because sadly to say, um, there was a publication came, that came out in the uh, early 2019 from our colleagues down in Wapato. They suggested that a lot of our lower Yakima Valley is very susceptible in this paper to the spotted lanternfly if it was to get in here in the industry. Um, if you look out in your backyards, even in your neighborhoods, I bet a nickel you'll find a tree of heaven, um, either near a, uh, a roadside, a, uh, an abandoned homestead, or a railroad, uh, highways. Um, th these trees are all over our state. We're starting to map them out uh, just because we're realizing this is going to be a big project. This is something we need to all be involved with as um, concerned citizens, uh, scientists. Uh, this is something that uh, if Washington State responds now with, uh, we can actually help prevent the uh, spread of this subsequent pest. All right, so this slide shows the possible sites of transmission and establishment um, here in Washington State. So sadly, um, Washington is, uh, again, as we had mentioned, uh, stable or, and suitable for a spotted lanternfly establishment. If it was able to survive the trip over to the Pacific Northwest, uh, more likely we'd probably see um, first introductions on the um, uh, west side of the Cascades or maybe even in the uh, Spokane area. Those are great sites for a uh, pest to sneak into our, uh, our state. So um, obviously we got to start looking for them in those regions. We've got to start looking at a lot of areas. Of course, there's also other close calls that we've seen in the past couple of years. Um, in Oregon State, two spotted lanternfly adults have been detected for the first time back in October of 2020. That was just last year, folks. One was found in a shipment of plants and ceramic pots delivered to businesses in Benton County. The other one was detected in a shipment of new shipping boxes in uh, Marin County. Um, interestingly enough, both spot lanternflies were um, um, detected and were shipped from spot, um, Pennsylvania. The good news is that they were both found dead when collected, but that was a close call. And that's uh, how many times are we gonna have a lucky break like that? Um, well, here's, here's some other things to um, you know, con continue to you know, put us all on edge, so to speak. In addition, to ca in addition California has had several close calls. Uh, according to the California Department of Food and Agriculture, um, uh, back in 2019, they intercepted uh, a total of 11 dead spotted lanternflies on cargo airplanes from Pennsylvania as they were in in inspecting the goods in these airports in Sacramento, Stock Stockton, in Ontario, California. So obviously we're having these close calls, but this is a real problem. Um, allowing these pests to in, in be in constantly introduced will eventually allow for establishment. So we need to be ready. 
So yes, we're talking about the human as a vector, vectoring these uh, uh, pests into our industry. But what about plants and vegetation? There's other ways for a pest to uh, um, migrate and to be introduced into our state. It can't always be the human's fault, although we, we did definitely play a major role in the introduction of this pest. Um, ironically, it was imported into Pennsylvania on a, um, a, a couple of egg masses, at least that's what we think back in 2012, uh, on some, uh, uh, I think it was stone used for um, modeling our um, landscaping. So since then, of course, we have this nightmare now. So uh, spotted lanternfly makes uh, use of over 70 different host plants. It's a polyphagous feeder. And remember that, that tree, I keep kind of mentioning the tree of heaven. Uh, this is actually a reproductive host of the uh, spotted lanternfly. So this is actually a tree, again, it's not just in our state. If you look and start doing your research, you'll start realizing with horror, it's actually all over the uh, uh, North America. So this is a great way to have a land bridge that can integrate this particular uh, Fergorid and from the East Coast all the way over to our side. Um, in fact, actually there's reports that these particular insects can travel about 12 uh, miles per year. Now, whether that's true or not will depend uh, on host plant availability. And of course, we've got a lot of that. And it's, it's an expensive project even to think about trying to remove Tree of Heaven, but it needs to be, uh, needs to be addressed. So Tree of Heaven, uh, these are uh, plants, um, uh, sap suckers, who really do enjoy uh, many host plants, but they specifically enjoy Tree of Heaven. Um, a little bit about the Tree of Heaven. Uh, Atlantis altissima, that's its Latin name. Uh, Tree of Heaven has a light bark, it's smooth, it's got compound leaves. Tree has a strong odor. And if you see here in the photo, if you break off a branch, it produces an empty heart-shaped scar. So that odor that they uh, produce, I don't know if anyone here has actually ever um, broken off a stem and, and just kind of smell the uh, uh, material, but it actually smells to me like uh, fermenting uh, peanut butter. So it's not a very pleasant smell to behold. However, um, it's an easy way to acknowledge, oh, this is probably a uh, tree of heaven. Again, you can look at the obvious things, smooth bark, uh, and then, it, of course, have the compound leaves. The edges of the leaves are smooth. And the reason why that's important is we're going to talk about a, a, um, a native species of plant that sometimes can get confusing. Another pest that they'll go after are the uh, black walnut. Uh, bar the uh, bark is rough. It has raised um, ridges. The leaves are smaller, or excuse me, similar. It, it has a strong odor as well. It's kind of bitter, in my opinion. But uh, they're obviously different in form. Uh, the leaf scars have a, a mouth and eyes. So again, if you look at the uh, um, leaf scar here, uh, much different than that heart shape that the tree of heaven produces. So sumac. <laughs> so I have to, I have to uh, admit, I actually was confusing the sumac with tree of heaven for uh, several years, in fact. Um, but uh, after some proper uh, research, I was able to uh, discover um, a while back that, uh, no, no, this is actually a completely different uh, species. So again, each plants, um, here you, you have the bark of the uh, sumac. It's, it is much smoother. Leaves are serrated or toothed. So if you compare the leaf of a, or a compound leaf of a uh, tree of heaven with a compound leaf of a sumac, uh, they are actually different. And so it's easy to tell. I didn't notice that, and so that's a very quick way to uh, define the two species. Uh, they have a milky white sap when broken. Uh, the seed head is distinctive. You have this red flowering um, um, feet, uh, character. Tree almost has no odors. That's another telltale sign. So you can smell it. If it doesn't produce that rancid um, peanut butter smell, then probably you have, and, and if it has serrated uh, toothed leaves, you've got a sumac. Look for those uh, um, fruiting uh, um, buds there. These scars have circles in a heart. So again, it's not really looking like the tree of heaven, but that's something to uh, make sure you uh, define the two species. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, especially crops that the uh, spotted lanternfly likes to go after. 
Uh, remember how we mentioned that there's uh, over 70 different species? Um, many of those are actually specialty crops that we actually invest heavily in. So this is actually very concerning to Washington because in addition to damaging grapes, it also poses a risk to orchards, hardwoods, and nursery industries. All of these industries are major, contrib uh, major contrib contributors to our economy. So spotted lanternfly poses a significant risk to a lot of what we have here in the valley. In Pennsylvania, spotted lantern, spotted lanternfly populations have been detected and managed in grapes, and the damage is significant. Uh, when is the spotted lanternfly feeds on grapes, they excrete what um, a, um, a fecal matter. That waste is called honeydew. Uh, honeydew is actually a very sugary substance. As they feed and excrete it, it lands on the grapes and the grape leaves. And you can see that it clearly in this picture right here, I hope you can see my cursor, but you can see here, here's some uh, honeydew, but then you start seeing this black material. This is actually a black mold. Um, this leaf is actually covered with honeydew, but all the sugar in it eventually does start to promote that black mold. Uh, this of course leads to a mold problem throughout the vineyards. Sadly, if you only apply chemistry so late into the season, uh, or you, you can only apply uh, chemistry so late in the season with uh, grapes. And as the adults are feeding late into the year, this, this will pose a problem for the uh, grape uh, industry. So I'm gonna, I like to show you a film. I'm really hoping we can see this. Now, just right here, let's see here. It's gonna start to excrete. Hang on. Oh, you can see there's some uh, water or material. Oh, there it was. I'm going to go back. Oh, do you see that? So that right there, let's see. Oh, there's some honeydew that they're, um, they're excreting. Well, anyways, you get the point. So this honeydew that they're raining down on the uh, surface of these plants is uh, devastating our industry. In fact, actually, uh, grape growers over in, the, uh, in Pennsylvania some of them have literally lost their entire uh, uh, vineyards due to this particular pest. So obviously you can see that this could be a serious problem. Um, it gets to the point where in some cases that the uh, honeydew that these uh, insects excrete is so um, dense that it can actually disrupt your vision if you're looking under the tree that they're excreting from. So the thing is, it gets to a point where it's like, it's raining honeydew, disgusting. I've, I've had colleagues um, tell me that um, if you walk on the, uh, the grass uh, after they've been raining their honeydew, it, it kind of hardens a little, so it's kind of crunchy, has a very um, unpleasant odor to it. So not only is it a, a, a nuisance pest, um, it's, it's gonna wipe out the industry if it was to get out he here. All right, so here's another film on uh, spotted lanternfly congregating on apple trees, but they appear not to be interested in the fruit, but the soft woody tissues. However, this does not stop them from dropping their honeydew onto the surface of the apple, and thus promoting those black molds we've been referring to. So again, let's see if this works, I'm hoping. So how would you like to see this in your uh, apple tree in your backyard or in your, uh, your uh, commercial orchard? Um, quite disturbing when you see it. Uh, here we have a little uh, spotted lanternfly cli climbing over the camera. So you can imagine how annoying this could be if you're a homeowner and you have thousands of these insects crawling all over your, uh, your home. It could be not only an um, economic pest, but a psychological pest. Um, I've actually had cases where with uh, brown marmorate, a stink bug here in Washington state, where I've talked to family members, uh, families who have had family members uh, emotionally distraught about stink bugs. What, what would happen if these uh, little guys come over here into our state and start uh, you know, attacking the apple industry? So this is actually what I'm trying to do is let you guys know um, how serious this uh, pest could be if we are allowing it to uh, get into our uh, state. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, biology or the life cycle of this insect. So we'll cover a little background of the insect. And again, as I said, the biology of the, of the life cycle, 
Typically, spotted lanternfly eggs hatch in and around May through June. Uh, starting in June through July, the first insects will molt and become the second instar molting, uh, which will happen again in mid-June through uh, mid-July. To give a third instar, and thus through September, you get the fourth instars, okay? So it produces one generation in a year, and it has all of these generations that are, uh, are all these uh, instar stages developing within that generation. At the fourth instar stage, when you start to see some of the uh, distinctive red coloring on their body, wing pads start becoming more pronounced. My colleagues over on the East Coast have mentioned that this is about the same time that they start seeing a significant uptick in calls from residents reporting that they've seen and witnessed spotted lanternflies on their uh, property. Starting in late July through December, you can see here, adults are present and do not overwinter. So after, it, so after as the temperature drops to freezing levels, the adults will die off. So they aren't overwintering. Uh, they lay their eggs. They, those eggs survive the winter. And then those uh, first instars again pop up in, the, uh, in May through June. And then the whole process starts all over again. Um, egg laying occurs from October uh, through November. And then those eggs are found um, in October through June of the following year when they begin to hatch and the cycle starts again. Spotted lanternfly adults lay on average between 30 to 50 eggs. They can be laid on the trees or on smooth surfaces. It's important to point out that this picture on the left shows a cluster of dark eggs, uh, spotted lanternfly eggs that is, uh, without its waxy covering. Those eggs are typically laid in a, a line formation, very similar to what you see here. That waxy material that I just mentioned is actually what they cover all of their eggs with. It, it basically, it's a gray substance which appears to give the eggs a little more protection. So over time, when you, uh, what you do not see are the tiny black eggs. But you see something like this where it's almost just covered um, like little um, pieces of putty or dirt uh, so it, it, as it dries out either on the tree or on the uh, or in the uh, in the case of uh, um, undersides of, of stone uh, or they're very cryptic uh, you can they'll kind of lay their eggs over on any surface that you can imagine you see um, you know uh, this individual is pointing to a uh, spot of lanternfly egg with that waxy material it almost looks like that stone slab so again as I said before, it's cryptic. It's easy to uh, hide and they lay on pretty much any substrate that they can get their hands on. So researchers are having pretty, uh, having pretty much to look everywhere to uh, find this pest. Although this method only works in states that have spotted lanternfly. Um, however, I think it's worth going over to uh, sample for these pests. We don't have the pest here in Washington state, as I said before. But it is worth kind of starting to think about how these insects are uh, um, kind of developing. So the photo on the right is showing a tree with its bark peeled off and a bunch of egg masses on it. It's been shown that the spotted lantern flight will land on trees that have bark that is peeling and will actually climb down between the bark and lay their eggs, which was which then of course is adding it more of a challenge to uh, researchers. So again, that method I, I was just kind of um, hinting towards how to collect these, in, uh, these eggs. If we find them here in Washington state, uh, one method in collecting spotted lanternfly egg masses is to take a small vial or plastic container of rubbing alcohol. Make sure to have about 70 to 75% uh, isopropyl alcohol in the vial. Um, you can buy this alcohol at any of your local drugstores. Take a small stick or a plastic surface um, you know, I've, I've heard people mention the term like a credit card. I wouldn't use my credit card personally, but I, I you know, but I can see it's, it's, a, it's a solid material that you can uh, help kind of scoop the eggs. Um, you know, basically you push gently on the surface of that waxy material. And you can see here that kind of the eggs start to naturally pop out, catch the eggs in your vials right here in your hand, and then completely get all 50, uh, 30 to 50 eggs. This is a great way to collect the eggs and preserve them when you turn them into WSDA. Again, we don't have spotted lanternfly here in Washington State, but this is a fairly easy protocol to uh, follow. Nymphs are active crawlers. 
you're going you're going to find uh that they uh, they're, they're crawlers and they and they're every every day they're crawling up and down plants that they feed on uh, you can use this activity against them as they crawl up a, a, a tree trunk you can basically band their preferred host trees and this is that banding process that we mentioned earlier in, the, in this presentation so basically you can band tr uh, the trunks of tree of heaven using a sticky uh, band that's uh, basically it's a glue it's a sticky trap uh, they can get these uh, uh, they can get um, high numbers of these uh, uh, um, what do you call it uh, nymphs on the uh, sticky bands uh, the, of course the uh, bands have to be changed out every two weeks and the counts of nymphs collected um, are often take quite a while at least on the east coast uh, notice uh, the bands in this paragraph uh, in this uh, uh, photo hold about 3,000 specimens and the other photo shows about 1,300. Uh, the specimens are uh, uh, basically nymphs, and you also get adults, but it, it, we find this to be very effective against nymphs. So that's actually a good thing. Uh, so another uh, interesting fact, adults begin to appear in late summer again. They feed primarily on trees of heaven, and they mate and lay eggs. In South Korea, females lay eggs twice per, uh, before dying. In the U.S., it looks like just one generation is made but they do have the potential to produce two generations. Female spotted lanternflies are capable of carrying up to 150 eggs. So if you recall er earlier, I mentioned that spotted lanternflies produce 30 to 50 eggs per egg mass. So it is possible that they could lay eggs up to three times in the States, but that is yet to be observed. Um, it also has been noted that males and females mate multiple times in a given year. So again, kind of re-going um, re back to the idea of vectoring, all life stages can hitchhike. So the uh, females can land on, you know, your trailer, uh, they can land on your car, um, you know, um, ladders. Here they're on picnic tables. But the thing is the females can land on the uh, a substrate, any substrate. They'll lay their eggs. Um, adults, re um, um, be when I mentioned that the uh, males are repeatedly mating, uh, you can have a, a, re, a, re, um, a reproductive uh, female um, migrate onto uh, new counties and new states. So that's what makes this very difficult when we're starting to see the uh, sporiatal distribution of these pests in the uh, region. And uh, we'll also make it very difficult if we find it here in Washington state. So obviously we want to keep our eyes out. Uh, this particular photo should kind of scare you a little. Um, if you notice here, I'm going to use my cursor right now, there's this huge grove in here in the background, that's all Tree of Heaven. Now, if you look at this rail cart, in front of it, you got Tree of Heaven, uh, and tree, oh, actually, see, that's not Tree of Heaven, this is, but this one right here, this is Tree of Heaven. So again, this is yet another example of what we're talking about, how it's so easy to vector uh, the spotted lanternfly all throughout the state. Um, this is probably more likely how we're going to find them integrating into Washington state. As if they're not coming through the docks, they're certainly gonna come through um, with uh, shipments. You can see on this map here, why should we care in Washington? Well, uh, this map covers a huge um, layer of uh, uh, rail companies that are actually um, migrating their uh, supplies over to other uh, regions in our state. So this is actually a big deal and concerning because if we're not keeping an eye on this, uh, this is how they're going to slip through our back door. And more likely, that's how they're going to be introduced into Spokane, Washington. So here's a little animation just to kind of uh, prove my point. Whoop! Voila! So there you go. That's kind of uh, disturbing. So for the uh, tree removal and trap methods that um, are being conducted on the uh, east side, most of Tree of Heaven are being removed or killed with herbicides. And it's very important to note that female trees are, in a, key to, are a key target for removal because uh, female trees uh, produce seeds, which can lead to more samplings coming up the next following year. Unfortunately, Tree of Heaven is an, is an invasive species. Uh, when you cut it down, one tree, if you cut down one Tree of Heaven without treating it, you are going to have to deal with the root system uh, because if you don't handle it correctly, 
uh, hundreds, if not thousands, are going to, uh, or suckers are going to grow in that area um, where you had cut that tree. So instead of having one tree, you'll have a grove. You'll have to use a herbicide like glycosate. Um, this can be done by injection or a hack and squirt method. And basically that hack and squirt method is um, where you take a hatchet, you make some deep wounds into the side of the uh, tree and you, and you squirt uh, the actual herbicide. There are other methods of injection that are more, uh, I think, safer for both the user and uh, for the environment, just because uh, you're not having to uh, have that additional step of uh, you know, mixing your chemicals. So again, if you're gonna be using chemicals, always make sure you read the labels. Uh, that's imperative for um, proper uh, protective equipment and your own health. Uh, for this slide, let's assume the dark trees are a tree of heaven. Uh, later, uh, those lighter trees are, are basically uh, kind of the other woods, the other area, other trees that are non-target, non so to speak. So we talked about how you can remove a tree, but what about um, targeting trees to use as a weapon against the spotted lanternfly? So again, as we mentioned, one method currently being used is to remove most of the tree of heaven in an area, leaving a few standing as trap trees. In turn, these tree of heaven are treated with a systematic in, uh, systemic insecticide, but it does not repel them. It actually attracts the spotted lanternfly in the area. Basically, um, uh, for basically a, a brief period of the year, the population spotted lanternfly uh, need to find the, um, a host, a suitable host plants. They look for these tree of heaven, and we believe they need the feed on them to complete their life cycle. Uh, I know a lot of my colleagues are having on the east side are having difficult times uh, trying to rear up their uh, spotted lanternfly in the uh, uh, lab without having to use a tree of heaven. They feed upon these in the insecticide and basically uh, uh, that actually kills them. So again, yeah, using a trap, a tree trap effect is actually very effective. What are the insecticides that they're tr uh, treating the trees with? Basically when the spotted lanternflies feed on the treated trees, they will die. The insecticide that they are using contains the, the active ingredients, um, dianoturfin, which is a trunk spray, but also systemic insecticide. Um, and what that means is that the insecticide is contained within the tree and the insect, insect is, att is attracted to that insecticide and they feed on that tree and die. So the trap tree method is an effective strategy. However, in Washington state, uh, we'll probably be focusing more on tree removal uh, as we have the advantage of being one step ahead of the, this pest. And uh, that is what uh, this slide shows. Looking at our one by one acre plot here, um, especially when we're talking about uh, you know, trap trees, we're basically removing most of the tree, tree of heaven. For this example, you can see why we leave a few trap trees, which we know the spotted lanternfly are going to probably have to feed on and sometime in late July or in August and September. So this is again, a very effective approach. Um, you know, by removing most of those Atlantis, you're able to cluster the individuals and uh, using basically dinoturfin, you're able to uh, kill them off essentially. Here, we're kind of showing the example of, of that clustering. Uh, they feed and uh, they, uh, they die. Hey Josh, just a quick time check. You got about five minutes left. Okay, well, I actually am almost done. So we're, we're good. Perfect. So basically um, in this slide, I'll, I'll just hurry up on this. Uh, this slide, you can notice all, there's only just the nymphs. Well, the nymphs like to feed on the uh, trees early on. Um, I'd like to point out that there aren't any non-targets in here. Uh, that dinoturfin actually doesn't harm a lot of our uh, uh, beneficial insects like the uh, parasitic wasps going after uh, wood boring beetles. So this is actually a, a, a very effective method. Um, here again, here's some more showing the uh, example of all these uh, spotted lanternflies dying from that, those uh, uh, trap trees. Um, again, there has been other uh, methods that they're looking into right now. Uh, there has, um, predators are being looked into. 
uh, that are attacking spotted lanternfly. Here you can see in the top left a picture of a predatory stink bug feeding on spotted lan adults. Um, and then, of course, on the right, there's spiders. Then here we've got praying mantises and uh, wheel bugs. Uh, sadly, the uh, biological control methods that they're looking at with predators is not very effective. So there's not a whole lot I can really report here. It's kind of a depressing story. So there are some classical biological control properties that are being conducted currently. During a 2019 expedition into Asia, Dr. Kim Homer and associates um, surveyed for natural enemies of spotted lanternfly in its invasive habitat. Uh, they were able to collect several natural enemies in the region. There appears to be at least two dominant parasites that they were able to collect. So this is actually really exciting. Um, I, I like parasitic wasps, so this is, I had to put this in. Um, one egg parasitoid in the genus Anastatus is showing promise as a biological control agent for spotted lanternfly. In fact, many Anastatus species are uh, attack stink bugs, which I would have talked about that too if we had any time. Sadly, we don't. Um, other parasites collected, um, the other parasite that's been collected is in the genus uh, uh, Dryenus. Uh, these are very interesting insects. Uh, you might have some difficult time seeing it with the, the image, but this species has a raptorial tarsis. I'm going to just kind of point right here in the forearms. Uh, so, uh, so it's kind of like a, uh, a mini praying mantis raptorial claw at the end of their tarsis that they use to grab onto their host and uh, immobilize their prey and uh, paras parasitize them. Another really cool thing about this particular wasp, if I can point your eyes to this uh, interesting um, globular mass on this uh, uh, nymph, spotted lanternfly nymph, is, uh, is that the larvae of these wasps start to grow, when they start to grow inside, they start to squeeze out of the body of the spotted lanternfly and they create this small sac-like um, structure called a uh, thiaculum, which they look kind of like a small round aphid mummy structure. And when the wasp le um, larvae gets bigger, most of its body will move into this thiaculum with the head still inside of the host and feed on the inside of the uh, body. When they uh, finish feeding, they, uh, the host dies off and this uh, thiaculum basically, uh, or the uh, wasp basically drops out of the host, spins a cocoon um, on top of a, a tree bark or other, pl other plant substrates. Then they spend the rest of the uh, year in the cocoon stage and reemerge in the following spring, right along with the uh, spotted lanternfly nymphs. So basically for the alien movie franchise, uh, this is basically a free one for them. So your nature is Basically, you're welcome. <laughs> uh, much more is needed to be learned about uh, how we can release these wasps as a biological control agent in the wild. Uh, we need to look at non-target effects, the wasp biology and ecology. So it will take years before we can release these wasps, which is good. We will have to be careful we don't want to repeat the um, um, similar uh, catastrophes like the cane toad in Australia. Or what about the harlequin be uh, ladybird beetle, which can um, outcompete um, many of our native uh, uh, ladybirds in this area, and they actually also feed on ladybird beetles. So releasing these wasps, yes, that's a great idea, but we need to make sure we do uh, proper research before, and that could take years. So I just basically want to leave you with uh, some um, slides. If you have any questions on pesticides, I would strongly re uh, recommend the uh, Pest Management Handbook. Um, another great resource to use is the uh, um, uh, what we see here, it's the Washington Invasive Species Council uh, website. Uh, they have a great app that you can use uh, for surveying. If you want to get involved in this, I highly recommend using it. I'm using it um, to uh, keep an eye out for Tree of Heaven or uh, Spotted Lanternfly. So I just wanted to leave you with my uh, uh, final slide saying, first off, thank you for having me here. Um, as far as uh, great places, additional great places to go to, um, there's the www.spottedlanternfly.org uh, website. That's the official website. And uh, here's my contact email if you have any questions, because I, I probably doubt we have enough time for that now. So um, please contact me if you have questions. I'd be more than happy to answer them for you. Uh, thank you for having me today. Thanks, Josh. I want to give everybody just a second to make note of Josh's contact email, and then I'm going to show the code word slide. So I want to make sure we get everybody their pesticide credits um, before we move to questions. But we should have a few minutes to do questions. You ended okay. perfectly. Right. Well, then, um, do you want me to stop sharing? I'm assuming. Yes. If you wouldn't mind, please. That would be great. Okay.
Okay, let's see here. There you go. Thank you. Let me do some finagling really quick. I'm getting I'm getting better at this. I'm getting faster. <laughs> All right, everybody. Can you see that screen? That is your code word for the day. So if you, again, are hoping to receive pesticide recertification credits, please type the word honeydew into the chat box. I will be saving the chat log when we conclude our meeting here today. And this is how I will be able to confirm whether or not you were in attendance. So I'm gonna leave this up for a few minutes um, while we get to some questions, just to give everybody a chance to make sure that they get it. But again, if you're here for pesticide research credits, type honeydew into the chat. And then when the meeting is over today, I will be going through the registration log and emailing everybody additional instructions to follow because we want to make sure y'all get your credits. So while we're waiting on that, I have so many questions for you, Josh. Everybody was very interested in this. Um, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, no, they were excellent questions. So let me move. I think you might even have answered some of these. I, th I feel like you were already spoke to this. So somebody wanted to know, they said that tree of heaven is being mapped, but is it also being removed? And I feel like you did kind of answer that. So is Department of Agriculture working with other uh, entities in order to remove tree of heaven that they find actively or only in certain areas? Well, right now, um, the uh, uh, fact of the matter is um, at, recently, the uh, tree of heaven was placed on as a, uh, a noxious weed here in Washington state. It's a class C weed actually. And so it's also an invasive species. The, uh, um, that question I think should be definitely considered for um, uh, the weed boards, the uh, uh, horticulture pest and disease boards, you know, as we're starting to remove it, um, trees right now, WCA is not removing trees but I, I'm trying to, in this presentation and future presentations, to uh, um, you know, put the pressure on that we need to start removing these trees. Um, I've convinced homeowners here in the Yakima area who have these trees to uh, remove them, and they're getting in contact with their uh, uh, WCU extension specialists for advice on how to remove it the right way. What I mean by that, of course, as I mentioned earlier, is that if you just cut the tree down, uh, you're going to have some uh, uh, major issues the following year. You got to get rid of the roots. So right now there isn't an actual method or an organized program uh, removing these trees. Um, I'm hoping to start uh, writing some grants, you know, this year to actually help um, support some of our industry. That way we can uh, attack this now before it becomes a problem. I mean, the tree of heaven's everywhere. I mean, you start mapping it. We're, we're, we've been mapping it out as of last year, and it's it's been a depressing. Um, survey, so to speak. Yeah, I could see that. I'm actually originally from back east. And even when I went to go visit my parents a couple of years ago, they had like four different trees of heaven in their backyard. And I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> um, they're all invasive species. So. Yeah, they're pretty prolific. Um, the next question is, do researchers on the East Coast think that spotted lantern flyer being found in urban areas because of tree of heaven grows in these highly disturbed environments, or is there potentially another reason that they're so concentrated in urban zones? That's a very good question. Um, the, the first uh, part of that answer, I would say yes. Um, tree of heaven is actually spreading around. Um, we talked about in some of the slides earlier that tree of heaven uh, is its main, one of its main reproductive hosts. Right now, what we know is that uh, it needs that tree in order to complete its complete um, generation, one ge it's, it's single generation in the year. But does that also mean that it couldn't undergo a host shift? A little too early to say right now. So I, I fear that there is possibility, but please prove me wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my answer to that question. Perfect. And you did mention this, but if you want to go over it, I did have a couple questions to this effect. What is the best slash easiest time for the layperson to look for them if they're, you know, have their Washington Invasive Species app out? Thank you for plugging that, by the way. And they're wanting to look for it just to kind of do their own surveying. What time of year is easiest to find them? I find um, it depends on who you talk to, because uh, I've, I've heard people report that it's easier to find them when they don't actually have their leaf or any of their foliage on. And you can just start breaking off the, uh, you know, branches and you can see the hearts and the smooth bark. And that's fairly a, a, a um, 
accurate uh, identification. I personally like to see leaves and the seed pods. So I like to start looking around, you know, in uh, May, June, July, kind of uh, in, even in the early summer. So the thing is, I, I like to have something to confirm. So I like holding the leaf and seeing, yes, this is a smooth leaf. When I pull off the uh, branch, um, I, I do smell that rancid, you know, um, uh, peanut butter smell. So I, I like to have something physically uh, too, it's, it's to the point, it's so obvious that, you know, you know what it is. So I think, you know, starting in a uh, late spring, early uh, summer is a good time, especially if you start seeing the seed pods, because believe it or not, this uh, tree has a, both a male tree and a female tree. So uh, like we mentioned, uh, the spotted lanternflies prefer the female. And uh, so we really do want to get rid of those. And you'll typically see a behavior where you'll have a solitary female surrounded by a whole bunch of males to pollinate her. Mm -hmm. So bit of a problem. Yeah, thank you. Um, let's see, there's a couple questions about growers and crops and things. Do we know anything about which of our Washington crops are most susceptible to spotted wing? You had mentioned grapes earlier. They wanted to know apples, pears, cherry, all the things. Do they oh, have yeah. a favorite? Specialty crops are on that list of um, host plants. Um, that slide I had at the very end that they uh, stop uh, spottedlanternfly.org please go to that website first. Um, but to answer that question, they do go after those other, um, the palms, they, lo they love peaches, they love stone fruits. Uh, they actually will go after hops, they'll go after uh, grapes. So a lot of our wine industry, the, the beer industry would be affected. Um, we really don't want to, uh, and frankly, I don't want to test that. <laughs> um, so the thing is, uh, yes, they will go after, they prefer soft woody uh, plants. Uh, ironically, they won't feed on the actual, at least they haven't been reported yet feeding on apples. But what they do is we saw in those videos, they're excreting all of that honeydew everywhere, promoting a black mold that basically will cause those apples to be unfit for consumption. So it, it's, it's that byproduct that really screws everything up for us. Gotcha, that's a good distinction. And then there was another question Assuming there was a spotted wing lantern fly detection in Growers County here in Washington, what steps should the growers take? Okay, that's a very good question. First off, don't panic. <laughs> um, um, what, what we need to do is to, uh, um, if you can collect it, um, put it in the freezer and report to WSDA as soon as you can. Um, what, one of the things that I like about the Invasive um, Pest Council is that they have an app already built where they, where you, actually you guys can, um, you know, use that app, that, or that app on your smartphone, take a photo, a still image, send it over to us specialists who are actually over there identifying the insects and we can do that part. And then we'll be like, oh crap, this is a big deal. Um, when it comes down to the eggs, uh, I would document it. I would um, do my best to um, gently put them into a little container, put them in, as I said, alcohol, um, I prefer, you know, ethanol versus uh, isopropyl just because isopropyl uh, will desiccate your specimens, but I don't know if you guys have access to that. Um, but the thing is, that's that's probably the most effective method. Bring it to um, the professionals. Also, don't forget, you can also go to your local WCU extension. Um, uh, extension specialists, that's their job. Um, so report to anyone who's a uh, in, at WSU or uh, USDA, but especially USDA, we really want to be in there and uh, be proactive. So there's a couple of uh, routes you can go. Perfect, that's helpful, thank you. And then you had mentioned at the beginning of your presentation that uh, there are lots of plans, response plans. Does, does WSDA have a response plan for each individual pest? Or is there just like one big response plan and then you tweak it to fit each pest? Well, we tweaked ours, our uh, spotted lanternfly response plan um, to that of, uh, you know, Philadelphia. I mean, they, they invented the wheel, so there's no point in reinventing it. As far as other pests, yes, we do have specific response plans because every, every pest is unique. There's different, you know, behaviors that they express. Uh, there's different hosts that they go after. So it, it is unique, um, although one of the most important um, methods, sometimes it's a shock attack, where if you find the pest, uh, maybe it's the best time to just flood the area with a pesticide and hopefully you might stop it. But that, that also is harmful to uh, non-targets and that can also get very political very quickly. 
Perfect. And I think we have time for one more question. Um, you had, again, touched on this in your presentation, but just to answer it a little bit more specifically, um, can these bugs be controlled biologically? You had mentioned something about a wasp and then a couple, that alien yeah, thing, yeah. that growth. <laughs> if you want to talk about that for a second. I didn't, when I saw that, I thought, now this would be a project to work on. I mean, I have to admit, I'm rather jealous with my colleagues at Kim Homer and all his associates who are jumping into that. But because we don't have spotted lanternfly here, there's no reason to study it. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the thing is, we have natural enemies that are trying to adapt to this uh, invasive. Um, like brown marmorated stink bug, a lot of our native natural enemies are not very effective. Uh, in fact, actually, I studied biological control of the brown marmorate stink bug here in Washington state, and I found an anastatus wasp, uh, very similar to that. Um, is it possible to go show that those photos again, do you think? Yeah, you should be able yeah. to share your screen. I oh, stopped great. sharing mine. Let's do that. Let's go back to the photo. Um, so you can see here, uh, bum, bum. let's go back. Okay, so here, uh, I'm gonna move this out of the way. Um, so again, Oh, what did I do? So again, we've seen Anastatus here. There's a native species, Anastatus reduvii, that has uh, attacked um, the brown marmorated stink bug here in Washington state. Uh, and that's actually kind of cool because that's a native wasp. But, you know, parasitism rates are somewhere between, you know, 14 to 17%. Nothing really to uh, brag about. And that's kind of the similar uh, behavior we're seeing with a lot of our native uh, wasps and uh, natural uh, predators over on the East Coast. You know, they're trying, but it's uh, not, not a whole lot to really report. That's why when Kim Homer and his colleagues went over to Asia, they brought back natural enemies from the um, habitat that these uh, native species uh, are these, uh, um, oh, I'm having a spotted lantern flyer originally from. And so they brought them over. These are egg parasitoids that are attacking the egg itself. And like that film aliens we talked about earlier, they will inject their egg and the, their eggs inside of the stink or the uh, uh, Fagorid's egg. And then like an alien, they'll eat their way out and do the process all over again. So that's what these two species are inter interesting uh, um, because they are a potential biological control option. But again, it takes years to really go through that non-target effect. And that's only in the laboratory. Uh, we don't really know what's going to happen out in the wild. So that takes a long time to get approval. APHIS is typically uh, involved with that. Um, so I could easily see an additional 10 years before we even think about releasing these. And I even mentioned in my slides that you know, we've had examples like the um, cane toad or um, you know, uh, you know, uh, invasive, uh, or now they're invasive, but exotic species that we've introduced into new habitats that just turned around very quickly and became pests. So classical biological control is a really cool idea, but you gotta be careful. But that's a very great question, by the way. Yeah, perfect, thank you. Well, that is, I wanna be mindful of everybody's time. That is all the time we had set aside for today. I hope you were able to copy down Josh's information if you think of Let any me, other uh, questions. Yeah. If you have any questions, here's here's my uh, email. Ooh, what I do? I'm not sure what I did here. I think I stopped sharing. <laughs> here, I can put it in the chat. Do you want? I'm assuming you want everybody to have your WSDA. Yeah, one. Def definitely contact me if you have questions. I'd be more than happy to share the uh, the data that we've I've collected on this pest. Um, again, um, responding to this is going to be key. Uh, being educated on what to look for. It's a beautiful uh, insect, so it's very easy to see. Um, let's not have it come into Washington State, please. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> this is not one that we want. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you so much, everybody. We were glad that you could join us. And don't forget, we're going to have a couple more events this week, so stay tuned for that. But I wanted to thank Josh so much for taking your time and expertise and sharing it with everybody. And this, this entire webinar will be recorded and posted to our YouTube site. So if you found the information valuable and you want to share it with your colleagues or you want to be like, what was that thing he said about biological control and go back and check it, this will be widely available in a little while. So thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you so much.